Okay, in this session, I'm going to talk about stem cell signaling and cellular differentiation. And I'm going to guide you to this website here, which is OMIM. Um, this is a really useful website to find out the function of any gene uh, that you ever want to find out about. So I'm going to talk about some um, a whole range of genes today. And to find out the background to that gene, uh, find out the protein it produces and what it does, uh, have a click on that link or Google OMIN, which is Online Mendelian Inheritance in Man. It's a really useful resource for finding out um, about uh, gene function. So today's session is all about cellular differentiation and what controls cellular differentiation. And that is a process of changing from being a stem cell through to a differentiated cell. So there are a whole complicated set of signaling pathways that determine whether uh, cells will proliferate or not and whether they will differentiate into um, the func final functional cell type. So for example here this sort of little cartoon illustrates uh, breast epithelial cell differentiation and the function of breast epithelial cells is to secrete uh, KC milk proteins uh, into these little ducts and then into these other collecting ducts and so on. And the breast tissue goes through rounds of proliferation and differentiation uh, in lactation and then after lactation uh, cells will de-differentiate. Uh, so something has to control the cellular behavior and it's key signaling pathways such as wind and notch and also other ones such as hedgehog signaling that controls um, the cellular behavior and the control of a cell for, to go from being a stem cell through to a functional differentiated cell. So if you look at other tissues such as in this case skin uh, what we find is that the cells are arranged in a particular order. Uh, here's the epidermis, the surface layer of the skin. Here is the dermis. And between the two is a basement membrane. And everything in the dermis contains connective tissue, blood cell, uh, blood vessels and so on, um, fibroblasts, stromal cells. Whereas up here is just really epithelial cells and these are the surface layer of the skin. And within uh, this layer of skin up at the top here are your dead, dried out uh, keratinocytes, whereas down here are your stem cells and basal cells. So basal cells sit on the basement membrane, stem cells are also down here as well. And we have, so we have stem cells somewhere in here, they start to proliferate and then they start to differentiate. And as they differentiate, they move up these layers until they stop differentiating. Uh, stop differentiating um, and also stop proliferating. So the non-proliferative skin cells are the surface uh, level skin cells. So skin cells have a limited lifespan and limited replication potential and their replica replication potential is used up as they migrate up to about here and then they stop proliferating and then they find themselves at the top where they die and flake off. Now this means that they have to be constantly repopulated by a stem cell population that divide very infrequently but give rise to transit amplifying cells which are highly proliferative cells which then repopulate the skin. So this image shows transit amplifying cells. Um, here's a stem cell and the stem cell can undergo a key feature which is asymmetrical division. So you have a stem cell here, it undergoes cell division one of those cells remains to be a stem cell. One of them becomes a committed transit amplifying cell that proliferates and gives rise to a new area of skin. In doing so, you repair the skin, but you maintain your stem cell numbers. And this is a key feature of um, stem cells is this ability to undergo asymmetrical division so that the stem cells themselves divide very infrequently. Their progeny, one of their progeny, divides very, very rapidly over a short period of time and then becomes terminally differentiated and does a job. So we can look at stem cell um, division in terms of um, self-renewal. And there are three possibilities. One of it is that the stem cell undergoes symmetrical division where one stem cell divides and both of the progeny are stem cells. And this typically occurs during a developing embryo where you need to uh, bulk up the number of stem cells that you have. It can also occur other times, but that's where this is the main form of 
uh, stem cell division. You've also got environmental uh, asymmetrical division where a stem cell sits in a stem cell niche, which is just a small uh, area of very specific extracellular matrix that gives this cell a particular behavior and environment. That environment uh, defines the stem cell behavior and we'll come on to integrins in a moment. The cell undergoes cell division. This cell remains in the stem cell niche. This cell gets booted out of the stem cell niche and becomes a transit amplifying cell and gives rise to the terminally differentiated cells. We can also have divisional asymmetry where one half of the stem cell is effectively programmed to be the future stem cell. The other half is programmed to be the non-stem cell. So this and this may actually be, this divisional uh, asymmetry may be entirely dependent upon the environment, but they are uh, both ideas and concepts uh, to help explain how stem cells divide asymmetrically. Now I mentioned the stem cell niche earlier, uh, and that stem cell niche for many stem cells uh, is dependent upon the beta-1 integrin. Now you've covered the integrins in a previous lecture, uh, these are extracellular matrix um, binding um, proteins in the cell. So it links the cell to the ECM. And what we find that if the cells can express um, beta-1 integrin, they can interact with the stem cell niche very well. And then as the cells start to differentiate and cease to be a stem cell, they lose the beta-1 integrin and then they can no longer interact with the stem cell niche. So as they move out of the stem cell niche, they lose the beta-1 integrin, or because they've lost beta-1 integrin, they move out of the stem cell niche. Uh, this beta-1 integrin is uh, effectively the cell's receptor for a certain type of type 1 collagen, which is characteristic of the stem cell niche. So we often find that stem cell populations in uh, certain tissues will express alpha-2 beta-1 integrin, which allows that interaction with that very specific form of collagen. Now this slide explains how proliferation and differentiation are inversely correlated. So here are some cells in the stem cell niche. They undergo asymmetrical division. One cell moves out of the stem cell niche. It ceases to express alpha 2 beta 1 integrin so it can't interact with that collagen and it's now a transit amplifying cell and that will double and double and double again and build a new patch of cells. So it proliferates very very rapidly but over that period of time, it loses its replication potential, which is the number of more times that it can divide, but it increases its differentiation. So these are stem cells, these are undifferentiated transit amplifying cells, and as they proliferate uh, more, they will slow down their proliferation and start to increase their differentiation, and they could become uh, neuroendocrine epithelial cells, they could become basal cells, they could become secretory epithelial cells. So these are the cells that are doing a job within a, for example, within a glandular tissue like breast or prostate. Um, and you have multiple types of epithelial cells within those tissues. So these are doing a job. These are proliferating and these are going to give rise to the next round of proliferation. So this slide shows the uh, differentiation of the intestinal lumen. So the intestinal lumen is lined with epithelial cells, they could be absorptive type cells, they could be mucus secreting cells, they could be acid secreting cells. And they all differentiate from a stem cell population which are hidden down at the bottom of a what we call a crypt. So up here is where all of the, the food passes by, down here is a very protected crypt area. Now the crypt contains a stem cell niche and that stem cell niche is defined by both the extracellular matrix that's there, so the collagen, and secreted factors from stromal cells. And these stromal cells help to define the base of the crypt uh, where the stem cells reside. In the intest uh, intestinal epithelial cells, they are tightly controlled by the Wnt signaling pathway, which is the first pathway that I'm going to explain on the next slide. But to summarize it, the Wnt signaling pathway, Wnt's are some secreted glycoproteins that act very locally. So these cells here are secreting Wnt, growth factor, uh, Wnt stem cell controlling factors, and they help keep the stem cells as stem cells whilst they're in the niche. 
but also drive proliferation of the transit amplifying cells when the cells are out of the niche. So these cells here, which are out of the niche, are dividing very, very quickly under the control of WINTs. As the cells then migrate up the crypt, they come to a point where these WINT signaling uh, proteins no longer act because they are short distance acting growth factors. And then the cells get to this point here. They're no longer under the control of WINTs, so they differentiate into the various different uh, cell types and continue migrating up until they reach the surface uh, of, the of the intestines. So this little label here says beta-catenin on, and beta-catenin is the transcription factor which is uh, stabilized by WINT signaling. So when WINT bind the WINT receptor, a transcription factor beta-catenin becomes stabilized, and the explanation of how is on the next slide. So here, beta-catenin is on, here, beta-catenin is off. So I'm now going to go through some stem cell signaling pathways. Firstly, the WIND pathway and then the notch delta pathway. Uh, there are lots of other signaling pathways such as hedgehog, uh, bone moth genetic protein and Hox. And this is why I put the link to the OMIN pathway, uh, sorry, the OMIN site on the first slide because some of these pathways have some pretty strange names and it's interesting to go and find out why they are called what they are. So the WIND pathway stands for wingless uh, integration and that's uh, a pathway that is disrupted in fruit flies which is a developmental uh, model to study um, gene, you know, developmental genes so we look at fruit flies and if the wind pathway is disrupted we can develop a fly model with no wings equally if we mess up a different pathway we get flies with notched wings or delta which is a different shaped wings and hedgehog results in some spiky um, fly larvae. So if you go onto that OMIM site and read up on the different stem cell related proteins with weird names, you can find out where those weird names come from. So firstly, the WIND pathway. Uh, I'm going to go through this in a moment, but we, we, what we result in is beta-catenin transcription factor becoming stabilized when the WIND signaling is on. So WIND bind to their WIND receptors that activates a protein complex which stabilizes beta-catenin and prevents it from being degraded by the proteasome. So last week we learned about the proteasome and we're going to come across another E3 ligase very shortly uh, which uh, is responsible for the normal degradation of beta-catenin. So this is the WIND pathway and shows all of the uh, different key components. So. WINTs bind to a cell surface receptor called frizzled. Um, when WINTs are, I'll start on this side, when WINTs are bound to frizzled, um, the activation pathway is to activate a protein called disheveled. Now disheveled inactivates this protein called GSK3 beta. GSK3 beta is a kinase and its job is to phosphorylate beta catenin. Now, the phosphorylated version of beta catenin is here, uh, and the phosphorylated form is degraded by the proteasome. So, when WINT signaling is present, WINT binds the receptor which activates disheveled. Disheveled can then bind to GSK3 beta to inactivate it. The end result is beta-catenin is un unphosphorylated and cannot be degraded by the proteasome. In contrast, in the absence of WINT signaling, disheveled is inactive, so it can't block the activity of GSK3 beta. So GSK3 beta is currently active, and therefore beta-catenin gets phosphorylated, and then the beta-catenin is recognized as being required to be degraded and there is a specific E3 ligase called TRCP here which is an E3 ligase that recognizes beta-catenin and sends it for degradation. So this is how the pathway is controlled. It's all down to the beta-catenin transcription factor. Now this whole pathway relies upon frizzled, disheveled, axin, uh, APC and GSK3 beta all being present and uh, intact. And as we'll find out on the next slide, this protein here, 
APC is often uh, altered and inactivated in cancer. And we're going to see how the effect of that has on cancer cells. And equally, beta catenin itself can be overexpressed in cancer. So if we uh, lose the ability to produce APC protein or overexpress beta catenin, you end up with loads of beta catenin and uncontrolled proliferation. So just to summarize, activation of the Wnt receptor frizzled by Wnt um, inactivates GSK3 beta. That means that GSK3 beta cannot phosphorylate beta catenin and then beta catenin um, is stabilized and can bind to its, um, it acts as a transcription factor to activate it, it binds to the TCF left transcription factors and switches on um, genes such as cyclin D1, which helps to drive proliferation. So we can see how this um, affects, this pathway can really tightly control cellular differentiation and also what goes, what happens when this pathway goes wrong. So this diagram here, you've seen half of this diagram, this actually shows, this is a full diagram showing an intestinal lumen. On the left hand side, it is what we call a wild type crypt, that is that all of the genes are functioning normally. On the right hand side, we have an APC null crypt. That means that both copies of the APC gene have been inactivated. And this is what happens in the initiation of colon cancer, for example. So on this wild type crypt on the left hand side, wind signaling is active. All the cells down here are being driven by wind signaling. They're proliferating very quickly. They get to this point here and the wind signals no longer reach this far. So the cells stop proliferating and start to differentiate and move up and become mature colon lining cells. On this side of the pathway, we've got some stem cells here which are APC deficient. APC is adenomatous polyposis coli, which is also the name of a hereditary uh, colon cancer syndrome. So these stem cells here are APC null. They give rise to uh, transit amplifying cells which are also APC null. And when they reach this point here where they would normally stop proliferating, they carry on proliferating because APC is deficient. APC is completely null. Um, so these cells just carry on dividing because there is no way of phosphorylating beta catenin to degrade it. So these cells effectively are behaving as if the wind signaling is switched on, even though the wind signaling is off, because APC is absent. And if we look at what, where APC is, APC is this protein here. If APC is missing, you can't have this complex forming and you can't get beta catenin phosphorylation. So you have beta catenin stabilization. So these cells here have got beta catenin stabilization. They will continue to proliferate even when they've migrated away from the crypt. And this is how colon cancers uh, initially form. It's a defect of the Wnt signaling pathway. So in the Wnt pathway, beta catenin activates these TCF left transcription factors. You don't really need to know much about these other than they switch on cyclin D1. Now you all know that cyclin D1 is the initiation of G1. It's the first cyclin to be switched on in response to growth factor signaling. So Wnt signaling is activating, uh, stabilizing beta catenin, which is switching on these transcription factors, which is switching on cyclin D1. These target genes also generally uh, are antagonized by the TGF beta pathway. And you should all know that TGF beta is the anti proliferative growth factor. Okay, so this is the end of part one uh, of this lecture. In part two, I'm going to go through the notch uh, signaling pathway. And then I'm also going to go through some uh, experimental models for studying uh, stem cells in the lab, typically cell culture based experiments.